I'm Cheryl Crow. I founded this company, Arthritis Life, which is meant, or the mission of it is to educate, empower, and inspire other people with arthritis. So part of what I like to do is do these kind of um, educational webinars. Some I also have like paid courses and offerings and stuff like that too, but this one's free, don't worry. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to get started. I've met most of you on social media already, I believe, and some of you are on my email list from other things. So so um, let's let's get started. Yeah, because we're recording this. We it's me. I am I am <laughs> everything. So um, I am recording this. So anyone who comes in late um, is you know can well can watch the replay. So I'm going to share my screen to my little handy presentation here get in presenter mode. Um, so the topic of today is three ways to manage stress with chronic illness. And it's even though I love doing. Um, public speaking and, and webinars like this, I do always get a little bit stressed right before, just because I think like anyone, you wonder, you know, is the technology going to work? You know, you just have a lot of last minute worries. So I was like, okay, this is good practice. I got to practice what I preach getting ready for this webinar here. So, um, so through, throughout this, again, feel free to write any, you know, questions in the chat or in the question answer. And um, just a little bit of a check-in. So you're in the right place. If you have a chronic illness or maybe you're like a loved one of someone with a chronic illness and you have felt stressed. <laughs> I think that's kind of like everyone with a chronic illness because it's a stressful situation for many of us, you know, wondering what does it mean for your future? Can I handle this? How can I handle this? Or maybe you've been overwhelmed, like found yourself sitting in front of a computer with 37 tabs open. These are not things I've personally been through, of course, not just kidding. These are definitely from my own life, you know, collapsing into a pile of exhaustion, trying to figure out on your own how to navigate this new situation you're in with your condition. Usually, um, you know, that's the first thing we do, right? You get home from the doctor's office and you look up all these things and that's good to try to find good information, but it can be overwhelming because often there's a lot of conflicting information. So also you're in the right place if you've ever just kind of felt alone and trying to figure out how to navigate this all, you know, on your own. So hopefully even just in one hour, I can provide some support. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about today is probably a little more what would be considered like advanced concepts, like very kind of not intuitive things that might be hard to totally come to terms with an hour. I certainly took a long time to learn some of these, but it's like planting seeds in your mind, hopefully. So first we're going to quickly, I have 57 slides by the way. So I, we have 60 minutes, 57 slides. So I'm going to do the best I can. I always get over ambitious. I always add a bunch at the last minute. Cause I'm like, I don't want to forget to say this, but um, we're going to define the terms talk about the relationship between stress and chronic illness, and then talk about the three strategies that I find the most helpful. Um, so why? I mean, again, I think it's pretty self-evident, but I think it's a good practice to review. It's important to manage stress so that we can actually decrease inflammation. Stress drives more inflammation. So if you have an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis, which is what I have, or any autoimmune disease, or many chronic illnesses get worse with inflammation. So it's good to manage stress so that we can decrease inflammation because it's kind of a vicious cycle. You get stressed, you get more inflammation, you feel worse physically, and then you're more stressed. It also frees up your mental energy to do other things that are important to you. So also, when you have you know better stress management, hopefully your relationships and well-being and quality of life improve. And then you know my ultimate goal, at least in my life, is trying to live a life I love despite my chronic illnesses. I don't know whether it's going to be cured in my lifetime, so I want to do the best I can to persevere, you know, despite it. Um, and so, quick, quick overview because you guys can find on YouTube or Instagram my my story. I share it all the time. But I've had rheumatoid arthritis for 18 years since I was 21 years old, mm -hmm. and I've been an occupational therapist for eight years. And I like to call us kind of life skills experts or life hack experts. So we're often confused with physical therapists, but we really focus on the minutia of like day to day life. How can you function in your unique environment and context, which I find really, really fascinating. And we we also are trained in the mental and you know, mental health and physical disabilities. That's actually in our scope of practice. So that really separates us for, 
from similar professionals like physical therapists. But that said, we work very closely with physical therapists and I love, every, you know, I love my physical therapists. Um, I'm also a mom. I was gonna say, mom, was I going to talk about my mom? Oh, wait, no, I'm a mom. So I have a seven-year-old child and that's um, something that people ask me about sometimes, you know, what's it like being a mom with chronic illness? Um, so that's not really what the topic of today, but I'm happy to expand on that if people have questions. And then I, again, as I mentioned earlier, I founded Arthritis Life to kind of fill some gaps I saw in just general patient education opportunities. It just seemed to be that people were just kind of left on their own. You know, here's this diagnosis, go figure it out. And there are some great nonprofits. You know, I'm a big um, volunteer with the Arthritis Foundation and Creaky Joints. And uh, there's a lot of people that are trying to fill this gap. And I just start wanted to get, you know, make my own little unique stamp on the world. Um, I'm, I'm allowing the new people to talk, by the way. So welcome. Welcome everyone who has just joined us. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to. I don't no pressure. I just wanted to let you talk if you have a question later. And then I created the Rheumatoid Arthritis Roadmap, which is an online course for people to learn how to navigate life with rheumatoid arthritis. And then I just debuted, just like literally yesterday. And, um, oopsies, I got a, a someone is unmuted, but it looks like everyone's muted. So I don't know. Oh, there we go. Um uh, room to thrive, which is an ongoing membership program of the roadmap, um, is a self-paced course at this point. And then the room to thrive is like an ongoing monthly membership where we can have access to like continuing education, like little trainings like this, um, but more customized in a small group to the people's needs. So I'm really excited. Camille is here. She's in the group. Um, so let's move on though. Cause you guys are like, okay, tell me about stress. Um, oh, here's, Really quickly, I'm just really into color coding right now. And so this is what Thrive stands for. So um, we right today, we're talking about the I part, inner world, like how do we manage our mental health, but know that the big picture is all these things, managing our pain and fatigue, habits, relationships, valued activities, and then executive functions. So, um, and I know that uh, Camille and Alia, who's I think also coming, had helped me when I was, I did a little focus group and some other of you also helped with the naming. So I'm glad that we, that Room to Thrive ended up being the winner because that's a fun one. So, okay, back to stress. So really quickly, what is stress? We tend to think kind of like, oh, stress is only a bad thing. But technically, like stress is kind of a neutral thing because it is our response to a perceived threat. And we need to be, respond to threats for our survival, right? So when we feel uh, stress, we, it enacts like our fight or flight nervous system. So we get ready to, you know, literally fight the threat. And our brain kind of thinks of it as like, a tiger or a mastodon or whatever from our survival um, instincts. So, um, so that's good if we have a real threat and in the short term, it helps us adapt. But at the long term, if you have chronic stress and it's actually from kind of um, additional mental worries you have that are not actually from a true threat to your survival, chronic stress is bad for our health, you know, particularly the immune system. And if knowing that feels more stressful to you, I'm sorry, it is a kind of a conundrum. You're like, you have to confront the fact that stress is not good for you. And then you're like, okay, but now I'm stressed about my stress, but it's okay. It's a cycle we all go through. So um, again, I really love these drawings. I do have permission from Louise Gardner to use them. You know, your mind is an alarm. It's keep trying to keep you safe. Your brain is is wired towards paying more attention to negative things because those are the things that are most likely to threaten your survival. So, you know, and again, if it's a tiger, you want your brain to warn you. You don't want your brain to be like, I am at peace and at one with the universe when there's like a tiger about to, you know, attack you. You do need that alarm system to get you stressed and moving. But um, the the downside is if we are chronically in that nervous system, uh, that well, we have one nervous system. If we're chronically in that fight or flight, it is again not good for our body. Um, so we also have this separate part of the nervous system, the rest and digest parasympathetic nervous system, that um, helps us. You know, they they call it yeah, rest and digest. It helps you literally get ready to. It's the opposite of fight or flight. Get ready to rest and digest your food. And so yeah, our brains just can't sustain fight or flight all the time. So things like mindfulness and relaxation strategies can help us um, 
you know, enact that rest and digest. And I love Gatel saying stress about stress a hundred percent and also heard of, yeah. So now if there's more awareness that there's fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. So that's true. The freeze is definitely one that I felt with, with overwhelm. You're kind of like, uh, there's all these things I need to do and I'm stressed, but I'm like, I am frozen. I can't do anything. So this is definitely just a very brief, like overview. <laughs> there's a lot more to it. Um, but before we move on to the techniques, I also wanted to differentiate pain from suffering. It's interesting like that, you know, many people in at least in the, um, the world that I inhabit with occupational therapists separate phys physical sensation of pain from suffering. So suffering is kind of like our mental response to the pain and pain is the physical sensation. So like if my shoulder's sore, that's the pain, but the suffering is from all my thoughts around that. Like, does this mean my medications aren't working? I can't handle it. I'm so disappointed. What am I going to do? So I think it's helpful to separate pain from suffering and just know that, you know, if you're struggling, you're not alone. You know, this is just for arthritis, but these are similar statistics across chronic illnesses. You know, 66% of people with arthritis felt anxious in the last seven days. 32% have a history of depression. And those are higher than the than average population. 19% have frequent mental distress. 92% say that pain interferes with their day-to-day -day activities. And people who have depression or anxiety have poor outcomes. Now, chicken or egg, right? Of You know, if you're having poor outcomes, you probably will be stressed or anxious about that or depressed about that. So I don't know where the causality lays in that, but it lies in that. But just know that these are statistics that I put here at the bottom. And if you want a copy of this, you can email me info at myarthritislife.net. And I'm happy to give you a copy so you can have it. Um, again, I probably don't need to tell you guys exam or you people, I'm trying to say guys, I'm trying, I don't need to probably explain too much examples because you're my, many of you are living this right now, but some, just some of the ones that, that stood out to me when talking to people over the last few years, you know, grieving the life I thought I would have staying organized with providers, feeling guilty about your medications and, um, you know, feeling like isolated from others in your life. They may, or, you know, sometimes it feels like people don't understand, but it can also feel like people misunderstand. And that's also stressful, right? You're like, well, you tried to understand, but you actually didn't understand correctly. And, and you're thinking that this is actually less serious than it actually is, you know, paying attention to your own needs and balancing your needs with the needs of the loved ones in your life. And this one really resonated with me. I feel like I could have written this one. Um, you know, it, it kind of can threaten your identity, right? Because it's like you go from I'm a person who takes care of others or I'm the high energy person to now I'm fatigued, you know? And yeah, Camille says, yeah, my body hurts too. People say like, oh yeah, I hurt my leg the other day. And it's like, this is not the same. So, um, you know, I, for me, the biggest ones are like the unknowns, like what's going to happen, especially when I became of like childbearing age and I wanted to have a baby and it was like, uh, like, am I going to be able to do this? You know, um, but I'm curious, feel free to put in the chat or unmute yourself and share, you know, what are some of your stress triggers for your, your chronic illness? If uh, only if you're comfortable and this is being recorded. So, um, and it will be sent to people. So if there's anyone else is feeling like maybe the unknowns or the overwhelm or the fatigue, Oh, change your settings to all panelists and attendees. Oh, sorry. Do okay. Allow. Sorry. Uh, unknowns, uncertainty. Oh, okay. Oh, the audience can un can change your settings. Audience can change your settings to panelists and attendees if you want to see it. Okay. What? Oh, yeah. Oh. Feeling like you're being flaky and canceling things. Oh, is someone unmuting. Anyone? Okay. Um, yeah. Unknowns. Recovering control freak. Yes. You are not alone. Oh my gosh. I'm like, if you could just tell me what's going to happen, I could plan for it. Right. Uncertainty. Okay. Yeah. Feeling dependent on others, all the appointments. I just, I had so many appointments in 2017 and 2018. And I kept telling my husband last year, like, oh my gosh, if this had happened, in 2020, I don't know what I would have done just having to go to all those appointments during the pandemic. So I really feel for all of you who might have been diagnosed recently, 
feeling like a burden. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys all for being, for your honesty. I think these are, these are huge. And before I say anything else about how I've learned how to manage my stress, um, please know that I have gone to therapy with a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And so I'm a huge proponent of therapy. There's no shame in getting one-on-one individualized therapy. That is like super, super helpful. And I wish that I had not waited so long. So, um, that's my little spiel. I remember yeah, normalized therapy. Last time someone said, stop talking about therapy so much after the webinar. And I was like, well, I need to help normalize this. So others don't do, I kept thinking, Oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. I'm even my, even when I went to therapy, I was like, it's not that bad. And I remember that one of the most powerful points of therapy was when my therapist said, you've been through a lot. And I was like, Oh, well, she's a professional and she thinks I've been through a lot. So I guess officially I have been through a lot, but I kept minimizing it to myself. So yeah, it's very validating. Yeah. So, okay. Here are just some tools. Again, I wish that, you know, we had like nine hours to go through everything. I could tell you everything I learned in therapy. No, the thing about therapy is it's individualized to you. So the therapy that worked for me may not work for you. So, um, yeah, fear, lack of sleep. And then you, I don't know if anyone else has gotten in that stress sleep cycle. It's actually happened to me at five this morning. I woke up at five and then I was like, oh no, I got to go back to sleep because I got to get a full night's sleep before the webinar. And then I'm like stressing about sleep. I'm like, I'm stressing about my webinar that it is about stress. I, ah, you know, so believe me again, then this is where my perspective has come full circle um, to acceptance. That's going to be the last one. And so acceptance actually helps me, right? Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to elaborate on what I mean by that. So ants, what are ants? What am I talking about here? I have lots of um, acronyms here today. So ants in stands for those of you who've been through cognitive behavior therapy, you might've heard of ants, they're automatic negative thoughts. And I made this little chart that I find helpful. I showed it to one of my friends and she was like, that's a lot. That's a big chart. <laughs> so, um, when I'm stressed about something, this is what I do. I look, think to myself, is this a thinking problem in the sense, like, is this arising? Is it possible that I'm thinking about this in a way that could be changed? Like, could I alter how I think about it? And that would make the problem better. Um, so the ants catching ants, automatic negative thoughts is a thinking problem. It's when my thoughts are too negative. And so I need to change how I think about them. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. Whereas the other two strategies are going to be about when it's not a thinking problem, when it's like, no, I'm accurately thinking about this situation and it's really stressful. So, um, so again, cognitive behavior therapy, also known as CBT is very evidence-based for anxiety and depression. And, um, I'm not, I'm not giving you therapy today. I'm just explaining what I've learned a little bit from it as an, I also have done training in this as an occupational therapist too. So it just teaches you how your thoughts and your behavior and your feelings slash emotions influence each other. So you learn how to be like a detective about your thoughts and figure out, is this thought I'm having like a true representation of reality or is it a distortion? So if, it's, if you determine it's a distortion, then you learn how to reframe it. So um, again, they're basically ants are automatic negative thoughts. They're inaccurate ways of thinking. And, you know, I, when I started paying attention to like the little automatic negative thoughts that came up in my mind, I was surprised because I don't tend to think of myself as like a really like mean or harsh person, but I, had I had realized throughout the day I have all these little negative thoughts about myself like oh my gosh you're so stupid you forgot that or yeah here so here I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you how to reframe don't worry so um so there are actually categories that that psychologists have have determined for different kinds of negative thoughts or distortions so um filtering is like a distorted filter so you only pay attention to what's bad I don't I think of it as like you have a um you have binoculars and it's like your whole life is this big picture and you're like only pu putting your binoculars or like a flashlight onto the mistake. So let's say, you know, you get a 90% on a test, you know, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm only going to pay attention to that 10% that I got wrong versus the 90% that you got right. Right. So in terms of, um, uh, labeling is another similar one where you kind of label people in a black or white way or label yourself. I'm stupid. You know, um, the, all the doctors are mean, the doctors don't care, you know, and these are things that it, it can be comforting to go into that black or white thinking. And when we're anxious or stressed, we tend to adopt that black or white thinking. 
Um, yes, I will. Oh, thank you, Linda. Yes, I will slow down. Um, so, so what we're talking about is to reiterate, ants are automatic negative thoughts. And a couple examples of them are the filtering, only filtering towards things that are a certain way, like that, that your brain is thinking everything ha is this way when really you're actually only looking at the negative and then labeling people in a black or white way. Another one is catastrophizing, but I'm not going to talk about that because it's really, really complicated with respect to chronic pain. And a lot of people don't believe it's appropriate to apply to chronic pain. So here's an example, very classic um, cognitive behavior therapy exercise, where you, what you do is you look at your situation. What was the situation? What were the thoughts you had? What were the feelings you had about that? What were, what's the behavior you took? And then what is an alternative? So Let's say the example, this is a kind of classic chronic illness one is, oh, I forgot to take my meds. And then the thought is, I'm stupid. I oh, that's a labeling. I always forget. That's filtering where you're only filtering to remember the situations that you did forget versus the ones where, you know, let's say for the last 30 days, you took your medicine 29 days, but you forgot one day and then you're only paying attention to the day you forgot. Your feelings would be frustration, anger, disappointment, and then your behavior is irritability. I'm saying this is an example from my life, you know, getting in a bad mood and then behaving more, you know, short or irritable towards your family. And then what's an alternative is you could actually have compassion for yourself and also you could reframe. So reframing would be the situation's the same. We don't change the situation, right? We, um, in this, in this case, it happened already. You can't, you can't not have forgotten your meds. <laughs> it's in the past. So what, what you can change is your thoughts and your feelings about that. So you can say, you know, I'm human. It happens. People make mistakes. People forget things. And, you know, I'm, I allow myself in that moment to, to acknowledge that this is just one day, it's just one time, you know, tomorrow I can do better. And then I, when I look at it that way, when I reframe it, I feel more at peace and more compassionate about myself. And then my behavior actually reflects my value. So that that's the person I want to be, right? I want to be a compassionate person, not only to others, but also to myself. So this is something you can do. Um, again, I think you know, self-forgiveness is, is very important. And we tend to get really hard on ourselves, um, many of us with um, these chronic illnesses. I don't know why, but we a lot of us are perfectionists. So, you know, I, I find it easier to be compassionate to others than my own self. I don't know if anyone else is the same way. But, you know, if you've ever heard that phrase, talk to yourself like you would talk to a close friend, um, that, that is good advice. So, again, this is something that you can go through, you know, slower and more carefully with, with a therapist. So this is just introducing you to the idea today. And if, if this resonates, you can try to kind of take it and run with it. Um, and I, again, this, so when is this helpful? This is helpful when I'm jumping to conclusions. You know, if one friend invalidates my illness and I jump to the conclusion, no one is ever going to understand me. No one ever is going to get this. You know, that is when you might want to say, wait a minute, mm, let's take a detective moment here. Let's see, is that actually accurate or is that an automatic negative thought? You know, it's, is it really, what proof do I have? That's another thing that you do with cognitive behavior therapy is you learn to, to gather evidence. And they do this with children too. It's a really great exercise. Um, there's some studies at a University of Pennsylvania where they study positive psychology and resilience, which is so cool, right? For years, psychologists just studied, you know, um, all of the ways that the human mind could, you know, um, have problems or issues. And then all of a sudden this Martin Seligman and University of Pennsylvania is like, well, what about resilience? What about people who go through terrible things and actually come out the other end of it? What, what are they doing? And they found out that there's this thing called explanatory style, which I didn't even put in here. Now I'm adding even more, but, um, which is, do you tend to think of positive things as permanent and pervasive, or do you tend to think of negative things as permanent and pervasive? And people with an optimistic explanatory style are the, are the ones that are least likely to get depressed. And they're the ones that think if it's a mistake, oh, it's just temporary, just one time. Whereas the people with depressive explanatory style, if they make one mistake, they perseverate on that. And it's like, oh my gosh, this mistake is lasting. It's going to have a big impact. And so you can learn how to reframe using the understanding of explanatory style. So I'll put um, 
that and then I'll put Dr. Mark Martin Seligman. Uh, he wrote a book called um, The Optimistic Child. That's fantastic. It's not really one that a lot of parenting people recommend, um, but I, I use it for my own parenting and for my own self. And so if it's a thinking problem, again, this is helpful if it's a thinking problem in the sense that the situation isn't the problem, it's how I'm thinking about it. But what do we do when it is um, not a thinking problem? But oh, here's another, here's another way to relate an example to my chart that I find helpful. If it's too much, ignore it. Um, but you know, if I'm saying something, nothing I do will ever make a difference in how my disease affects my life. You know, I'm doomed. The key is that when you have these statements that are like permanent, like nothing, everything though, or that are really, really global and black and white, that's usually a sign that, that you're maybe over exaggerating your thoughts. So, you know, it might be a distortion. So this probably is a thinking problem and you could reuse your reframing to say, to, to validate yourself, to say it does, it feels like nothing I'm doing is affecting how my disease affects my life, but the future is unknown. I could still try to learn tools to live better with this. Okay. So but, you know, the thing that I want to caution people about with CBT and why I think you need more tools in your toolbox is that sometimes people become, again, the perfectionistic tendencies of some of us, myself included, you can get you into this kind of thought um, loop where you're constantly second guessing your judgments like, oh, is it accurate? Is it not? And then you just end up kind of getting into the struggle cycle. Um, and sometimes it's not a thinking problem. Like, and that's that's where the catastrophizing has become very um controversial and pain in, in the pain community, because if you're saying that your pain is a big deal in your life, it is a big deal in your life. That's, you're not thinking about it wrong. You know, so who is, a, if a doctor tells you you're catastrophizing because you're thinking too much. Um, and yeah, this is totally me second guessing all the things. So that's where I think act is helpful. What I'm going to say, you know, um, next, these next two tools, mindfulness and act acceptance and commitment therapy have been really helpful but i think again every all of these pieces are useful um i do think that sometimes we have inaccurate thoughts you know and distortions and it's very helpful to reframe them but i think that that's only one piece of the picture here so okay if it's not a thinking problem with the question we so thinking problems go over here to the cbt stuff if it's not a thinking problem <laughs> um, we say, is it a solvable problem or a persistent problem? And weirdly enough, this technique is part of, it's, it's consistent with acceptance and commitment therapy, what I'm going to talk about, but it actually also comes out of marriage research from Dr. John Gottman in Seattle. And, um, if you've ever, never heard of him, I'll just put his name in here. Um, uh, marriage. He's a marriage therapist and or a marriage psychologist, and he studied. He's the one that can. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He can predict by watching a couple talk for ten minutes. He can predict with like ninety percent accuracy whether they're going to be divorced in the next ten years because of how they relate to each other. But anyway, so one of the things that couples in in um, in resilient and happy marriages do is that they separate solvable from persistent or perpetual problems. So solvable problems are ones we can actually do something about. So let's say, you know, your hand, you woke up in the morning and your hand is just throbbing. That can be partially a solvable problem. You know, take a hot shower to, to release the stiffness, or you take a pain medication or, you know, take your regular medications, put on a compression glove. Um, but sometimes we have problems that are persistent, that are, that we've done everything we can and they still persist. So what can we do? So that's what we're going to talk about next. So mindfulness. Okay. Mindfulness was hard for me <laughs> to learn, but it is about keeping your attention in the present moment without judging it and, you know, learning to be where you are without trying to change. And so why is this so hard? If you read my little email where I <laughs> rambled on a little bit about this, is that the very basic answer is that this can be hard if the present moment is uncomfortable why would you want to connect deeply with the present moment, right? I don't know if any else of you have been like, why would I want to be present right now? I don't like the present moment. I want to change it and fix it. And I think, again, it's because pain is telling us to find a solution. But I'm in a lull mood. <laughs> You're like, I know when my therapist first started telling me this, I'm like, eh, that's like for able-bodied people. That is not for people who are living in pain. However... The fact is, it, this is this can be very helpful if you have already done everything in your control. What can you do now? Um, it actually can 
help us basically accept that sometimes this is the moment that we have and it relieves some of the some of the pressure we can put on ourselves to fix an unsolvable problem. So, okay, so there's two choices to where you can put your energy in general. Um, I tried to find a picture of myself with a not smiling face. This was very hard because I like to smile for pictures. So if you have a problem, you have, let's say it's pain, you have, you have two choices, right? You can, well, you can try to make the problem go away or you can work around it and try to function despite the problem. Now, I think in most of our daily lives, we're doing a mixture of both, right? You're not like, it's not a black or white again, like earlier, we don't need to be totally black or white, but you know, when we have pain, we try, we have methods to reduce it the best we can and we can attempt to cure it or heal it or like make it go away. Um, but again, the, the thing is that those are what our brains usually are like a bias towards looking at, but at a certain point for some of us, and it's kind of like, it's like kind of an elephant in the room, but at a certain point, there is nothing more that can be done. And so what's available then? What can we do then? We can still do something. We can work around it using like life hacks for pain or um, activity pacing for fatigue to work around it and function despite it. So what can I still do now despite my condition? That can be actually an empowering thing long-term because it means that you can still do something even if you can't make the pain go away, okay? So if the problem is not pain itself, but the stress that we're having around how our Ill and illness affects our life, I like connecting to the present moment because it, it's a little bit of a workaround because it's saying, well, my stress is all about the future. Because my, and that's, that's because a lot of that uncertainty, all of you who said uncertainty, uncertainty is really about the future. It's like, I don't have certainty of what's going to happen. Is this next medication going to work? And I have that stress myself personally. I'm on my third biologic and I don't know the next one, when it's going to work. The first one worked great. The second one worked great until it didn't. And then the third, also the first one worked great until it didn't. The third one works okay. And then it's eventually not going to work like most of them. So in my lifetime, I mean, the, statistically it's most likely won't work. So it's, I think the part one is being present with that thought and validating it in my mind and saying that is, that's a thought <laughs> like that is, is that something though that I need to rush and stress to fix it right now? Or can I actually learn how to tolerate that thought? Cause it's probably, it's not solvable. It's not a solvable problem because the future is unknown. So it also reduces the stress again because it says, okay, well, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to go into this like cycle of solving an unsolvable problem. Yeah. And use of assistive devices, Linda says, is a good example of a workaround. So again, stress, you know, may, and anxiety make us seek control because we get this illusion that if we just can get control, we can get out of the, we can solve the problem. But mindfulness is like, what is actually going on right now and what is possible right now. Another thing that I'm not even talking about, but that's a big major part of mindfulness practice for a lot of people with chronic illness is um, not just focusing on the present, like cognitively, but just taking a moment to like center yourself and taking a deep, slow breath that can be really effective in helping like calm your nervous system, get it into that rest and digest mode. So you're out of that kind of fight or flight. Cause again, unfortunately it just might not be a solvable problem. So there, the fight or flights, it's like, you're not useful here. Someone else made a Star Wars reference, Star Wars, the Sith deal and absolutes. Oh yeah. That's good for distortions. Um, so, but okay. So that's partially helpful, right? <laughs> At least for me it is, but sometimes just the mindfulness is not enough when I'm really, really struggling. So this is saying, okay, it's a solvable persistent. It's a, sol it's a persistent problem. And then you, you know, you try to use your your tools and you're still stressed. Okay. Now we need to do our coping with ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. So the ACT has been really, really helpful. Those of you who listen to my podcast are like, oh my gosh, is she ever going to stop talking about ACT? It stands for acceptance and commitment therapy. So it's accepting your thoughts and feelings and like, and your present state exactly as it is. Then not just sitting there and being like, I accept it. Okay. Like, what do I do now? <laughs> you accept it. Then you connect with your values 
and then you take effective action. Okay. So I'm going to let Russ Harris here say it himself, or well, I'll say it in his words. First, you make room for your feelings, allow them to be exactly as they are. Then you ask, what can I do right now that is truly meaningful or important? And this is different from asking, how can I feel better? Once you've identified an activity you truly value, you go ahead and take action. I think this is the kind of, it's like a it's a very, it's a pivot from how we tend to think about it, right? Because I think in our American culture, we're kind of, um, so sorry, not all of you are American, by the way. <laughs> so those of us who live in a culture like the United States, that's constantly like, be happy, be happy, do, you know, all you need to do is do this and you're going to be happy. Um, it, it makes it, you think that the goal is, or the realistic idea is to be able to be happy all the time and that's, or feel better. I have a bad feeling. I need to feel better. And this is a very normal, it's not just a cultural thing. This is a very, again, when we talked about with pain, pain makes you want to solve the problem and feel better. But the, if you actually, that that's a very, um, for me, additionally, that adds an element of stress because now you're like, now I have to feel better. I have to feel better before I can live a good life. And what ACT has taught me is that I can still live a good life with while feeling physically not great. Like, and, and that's actually, to me, that's actually more empowering. Now, again, if I had the solution that, that would like cure everyone's illness, if all we had to do was like do a certain diet or do a certain supplement, like that, I would choose that, right? Like I would choose to eliminate my rheumatoid arthritis if I could, but that's not possible for everyone right now. Some people do believe that they have that solution and it's like more power to you. And if you find one that works for you, that's amazing. Do that. But for, for some of us, we've done everything we can. And what can we do now? We still have some control. We actually still have some power to take action. So that's what I'm going to hopefully, it's very hard to explain this in like 20 minutes, but, um, what happens is earlier we were talking about stressing about stressing, right? So one of the things I've learned about in ACT is you can't change your feelings, but you can change how you feel about your feelings. That's not something I read. That's just kind of what I was thinking about yesterday. So if I feel this person's feeling um, anxiety, and then all of a sudden they feel anxiety about anxiety, they feel sad that they're anxious they feel angry and frustrated and guilty. Oh my gosh. And this is a thought I've totally had. I've gone to therapy. I'm, I teach these people how to do this and I still can't figure it out. Why is this so hard? What, what's wrong with me? Why can't I figure out my anxiety? That's all these thoughts that are swirling around. I need to make this go away. I need to just, let me just go. Let me just try to be mindful and meditate for 10 minutes and see if it goes away. The problem is when, when meditation and mindfulness are used as a strategy to feel better, it, it, is counterproductive because the point is to connect with exactly what you're feeling and learn that, that you can survive that you can tolerate that. And that's part of being human. You know, if you're going to be a human being and in life, you're going to be feeling feelings and they're not all going to be happy, perfect feelings all the time and relieving yourself of the burden of always feeling only good, only happy feelings. It's actually makes you happier but you can't get there by trying to be happy. It's a very, very interesting, intriguing process. It's a very paradoxical. Um, so instead of saying I'm anxious, I'm anxious about being anxious, blah, I'm, I'm cycling here in this tornado of secondary feelings. You just say, here's anxiety. There it is. I don't like it, but I'm not necessarily going to struggle with it. And the metaphor that I really like that I learned from ACT is called your feelings and emotions are like passengers on a bus. So you're the driver and you're driving, let's say, where you, where you want to go. You know, where I'm trying to go is a full and meaningful life despite my health condition, the best I can possibly do, right? So if I, I'm going to have all these different passengers, thoughts and emotions on the bus. There's the freaking out one. That's like, you can't do this. You're going too fast. Pull over. We need to take a break. Or there's the, there's the mad one. That's like, who are you to think you can do this? Or the negative one. And then there's the, there's so many different ones that like they're shouting things to you. They're shouting, speed up, slow down. And a lot of times we are at the whim of our emotions, right? We think, oh my gosh, I, I have to listen to that. Like that's, it's telling me what to do when really we can just acknowledge them. We don't have to, I think with the, the way meditation and mindfulness are kind of packaged a lot of times, it's like, if you just are mindful, if you just, you know, take 
breathe 10 times, all your negative thoughts are going to go away. No, that the way that this works for me, at least, is you say, I acknowledge you, like you're on this bus. You're, I can, I could exist alongside you and allow you to be there and you can all freak out, but I know where I'm going. I don't need to pay a lot of attention to you. I don't need to struggle with you. You're there. And it's a really, really freeing feeling. Um, Tell is saying, I set myself up for failure. Yes. You set yourself up for failure by having the goal of feeling better. A lot of times though, doing something important or meaningful does help me feel better. Exactly. Yes. So I'm talking about like the thinking strategy part of this, but the doing, the doing is where we often get a lot of um, impact from this strategy where you, you say, what's, what can I do? What can I still do? That's meaningful, you know, and it, we can still grieve alongside that, you know, like I, I still have dreams of playing soccer right now. You know, I, I can't play soccer anymore, or it's not wise for me to, cause I, I hurt my neck in a car accident in addition to the rheumatoid arthritis. And so, but I still have dreams of playing it. And when I watch people playing, you know, going about and doing things I can't do, I it's okay to have feelings for, at least I allow myself to have feelings like, man, I wish I could do that. Yeah. Like I I'm sad. I'm sad that I can't do that anymore. But instead of struggling with that, like, oh, I need to make um, sadness is bad. I need to make my sadness go away. I just say, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a human being having a human emotion. That's okay. You know? And yeah, focusing on what you can do and give, don't give energy to the can't. I love that Krista. Yeah. Like Krista did a great TikTok video where everyone, you know, she's dancing. She's been doing dancing videos, you know, prolifically. And she has rheumatoid arthritis and people were saying, oh my gosh, you know, I can't do what you're doing. And she showed a video where she showed all the things she still can't do. The people didn't even realize like she can't, she can't at the time, couldn't completely unbend her elbows or comp- or jump, but she was still doing everything she still can do. She can move her core. She can move her shoulders, you know, so, um, you know, doing what you still can. So feelings often are like beach, a beach ball. So if you imagine that you're, in, in the water and this beach ball pops up and you're like, I want to make this go away. You can keep pushing it and struggling with it, pushing it down under the water. And guess what? It keeps popping back up. So we don't have to like them, but we can allow them to be there so we can get on with what truly matters in our life. Okay. So I think that acceptance helps me separate sometimes the solvable from the persistent problems, right? So the the solvable problem I kind of mentioned earlier could be like my joints are stiff and, you know, okay, there is a solution to that. Take a shower, you know, warm, warmth feels better. Persistent arthritis problems are going to be the unknowns, you know, how is this going to progress in the future? When will I find a medication that works? Can I trust that people around me will always understand, you know, that those are perpetual problems. And I don't want to spend a lot of time solving them because they're not solvable, you know? So I, I get, I free myself from the burden of trying to solve unsolvable problems. And again, it's this weird, I don't know. Some of you guys, you guys are saying you love it. So I hope, I guess I'm explaining it. Okay. Those of you who maybe are, maybe there's a silent majority who's like, what is wrong with her? But, um, you know, again, if we approach all the problems in, in our lives, like they're solvable, we're going to waste a lot of time. And, you know, I actually think parenting can be a good analogy here, right? Like a, t- a two-year-old, if you watch a two-year-old, you know, you're not going to make a goal for them to like feel a hundred percent self-regulated and have no tantrums and feel peaceful and happy all the time. Like we accept, right? We accept that toddlers are going to have emotions and we do the best we can to support them to function through them. But I think when we come be, become adults, we, we have this very unrealistic idea that we're just, if we just do the right things, we're going to avoid all, all suffering and all negative things. And that's just, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it reinforces this idea that we have to have a perfect life to be happy. And that's not true. You know, I mean, what, what would, what could you do with that mental energy if you could accept that some problems are unsolvable? So I I forgot to say earlier, um, and, and adult tantrums are okay. (laughs) Um, acceptance is very different from giving up or resignation. So in this, in the case of act acceptance literally means taking what's offered in the present moment. So I still have hope for a better future. And I still, I, I don't say that, okay, because my pain is bad today, it's always going to be bad. I give up. It just means that you are able to connect with 
and function during the present. Okay. So here's a couple more uncertainty. I mean, you all had, you all already gave some good examples, you know, but you know, what are your limits for the week? How do you gauge your own pain and fatigue levels? Um, worrying about what you're going to be able to do in the future. Now with this pain and fatigue levels, there is some work you can do about like symptom tracking and figuring out your own patterns. So again, it's, it's a, there's a balancing act between that solving parts of the problem and then accepting the problem. Cause I can say from my own experience, you know, I, I have a huge amount of tools in my toolbox for pain and fatigue, but sometimes I joke like a butterfly flapped its wings in Africa. And all of a sudden I'm having like a huge fatigue day. Like we don't always know we can learn as much as we can. Like my old soccer coach used to say, control the controllable, right? We can control our actions on the soccer field or football field. We can't control what the referee is going to say, what they're going to do. And I always find it funny watching soccer football, um, you know, when people are like arguing with referee, when has that ever worked? You know, so when you're trying to invalidate your own emotions, it's kind of like you're trying to argue with the referee. It's just not going to work. So, you know, being able to plan for the future, having uncertainty, this is a huge one, which route to take, especially when you're first diagnosed, should I do AIP autoimmune protocol? Should I do this? Should I do that? Everyone's telling me different things. I'm supposed to go vegan. No, you're supposed to go keto and eat a bunch of meat but also plants. But then other people are like, no, you need to do Mediterranean. And you're like, ah, this is so overwhelming. So, okay. I guess I've already given it away, but yeah, all, all we know for sure is it's unpredictable. So do you think uncertainty is a solvable or perpetual problem? <laughs> Anyone want to guess? I guess I've kind of already said it. Uncertainty is going to be a perpetual problem, right? That's why I think the mindfulness and connecting to the present is helpful because that's on this like philosophical level. And interestingly, acceptance and commitment therapy was like founded by some, it's actually a cognitive behavior therapy plus mindfulness. So some people think of it as like an arm of CBT because you are examining your thoughts and you're examining the fact that you're having thoughts. Um, so that's the cognitive part. And then, then you're having behavior um, you know, consistent with your values. And that's, that's like behavior from cognitive behavior therapy, but it's different because I feel like with CBT, I just struggle with my thoughts. Sometimes if I'm trying to apply CBT cognitive behavior therapy to a perpetual problem, that's not caused by my maladaptive thought patterns. So I said this in my last webinar, but, um, you know, I try to think about like these three different doors, you know, door three and hey, we all have gone through most of these. Okay. So door three is doom and gloom. It's never going to get better. There's no hope. I shouldn't try. The problem with that is that it doesn't help you engage in your life. And it's not there. It's not knowable whether the future is going to be bad. Positive thinking is door number one. It's the one I want to go in. It's like, it will get better. I will be able to control my future if I just figure out how it is comforting, but it ultimately is an illusion for many of us. There are exceptions. But number two is the accepting uncertainty. This is the one I've done a lot of work on. Again, in, in one hour, it's hard to get there. But, um, you know, it might get better. It might get worse. I don't know. I can still have a meaningful life despite that. And that's the way that I've learned. So again, it's okay if your brain, my brain is biased towards this door. Like I'm always going to want sunshine and rainbows and that's just my personality. Some of you might be wired more towards like, this is kind of, I'm more anxious and anxious people tend to kind of like hyper fixate sometimes on like making things better. And sometimes people who have a depressive kind of wiring in their, in their brain are more, more wired towards looking at the doom and gloom side. Um, but the accepting uncertainty, it's very freeing if you can get there. So, you know, again, one of my goals, yeah, feels like Goldilocks, moderation is key. You know, and this was, I, I included this because someone recently told me it was a really powerful quote for them. You know, I kept waiting after Charlie was born when my I was having a massive flare up, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll just figure it out. When I get back to 100%, we're going to figure it out. And then, you know, I realized I miss, I, I'm focused so much on, on, figuring out my disease and making myself feel better that I was missing out on my chance. This was my chance to be his mom. You know, I spent the whole first year on this like kind of waiting pattern and just kind of focusing so much in the future. I wasn't really very present with him. So what can I gain from accepting it really as it is, right? Rather than anxiously trying to tweak things and control them to achieve this elusive concept of feeling better in the future, what's possible now? We don't know what's gonna happen in the future. We literally don't, no one can tell you. I mean, past performance predicts future performance, but it's just still a prediction. There's no knowns, right, for the future. So 
again, thriving despite my symptoms, that has been the missing ingredient for me in, in really getting to the core of what stresses us out. Because I think the stress comes, like we, people talked about earlier, it comes from these unknowns and this, this re, almost like an ableist idea that you have to be healthy to have a good life. You have to be able-bodied and, and make your disease go away before you can have a good life. Well, what if you can have a good life and try the best you can with what is actually possibly possible to you right now? This is the only reality that's for sure is the present, right? So, you know, what I like about this is I'm not wasting energy on trying to solve unsolvable problems anymore. And I don't want to make it seem easy. This is not easy. It's taken me many hours. So if you're confused, that's okay. Um, but just to recap, so we have the catching ants. That's when it's a thinking problem, catching your automatic negative thoughts and reframing them. Being present, which is in acting and adapting, which are the ones that help with the perpetual or uns or persistent problem. Yes. Okay. So Gattel is also um, saying, yeah, that the internalized ableism it is real, and I really think it's it's really beneficial to free yourself from that. It doesn't mean like my life would be easier without a doubt if I didn't have RA my life would be easier looking back, you know, but it doesn't mean that I have no possibilities right now. And, you know, unless you're in a coma, you have choices, you have possibilities. And that's not to shame yourself to say, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm not, it could be so much worse. Why am I having such a hard time? No, it's, it's hard, you know, validate that to yourself, but know that there is, you can gain so much from focusing on what's still possible. So quick bonus tool <laughs> my, I'm really, again, like I said, I'm in a color coding phase. This is my rainbow phase. So this, so what I've just been talking about is all these inner world parts of my overall toolbox for, for managing my life with rheumatoid arthritis. But I'm, you know, the overall toolbox includes all these other things as well that really, really help me live this full life despite rheumatoid arthritis. And so um, again, these are things like focusing on what I still can do, what activities and hobbies are possible, how can I manage the CEO side, um, you know, being the CEO of my care, care team, my relationships, having healthy habits, and knowing I have a bunch of tools for pain and fatigue. So I've been using this word thrive a lot because it's like kind of my my mantra right now is can I th and thrive despite, can I thrive despite what's going on? Again, not it's harder, right? It's harder, but it helps when there's uh, when there's perpetual problems. So, I am going to transition to talking a little bit more about what this. And some of you already know because you're already joined because I couldn't wait. But um, you know, you can do this on your own. You could put together your own toolbox with the resources that are out there, or you could do it with support. So I um, think that the support way is the more. Um, streamlined and efficient and fun way. So I actually just started this membership program, like literally opened the doors yesterday. So it's going to, it's called Room to Thrive. Get it? Because we're thriving and we have rheumatic disease. You could, it's open to anyone with any chronic illness though. And it's going to include, oh, oh, sorry, the E stands for executive functions. And that's like being the boss of your care team or being the CEO of your care team. So things like tracking symptoms, developing medical literacy, like understanding what your disease is and, um, and organizing your records, all the organizational side and the higher level aspect of managing. Oh, talking to insurance if you're in the U.S. is one of them. So I'm going to be including every month we're going to focus on a different letter of Thrive, like tools for pain and fatigue or those executive functionings, a different month. And I'll do three trainings either by me or um, a guest speaker, a guest expert. And then we'll also have support and connection during our live calls and then a private online community. And this is just for, for people who want that extra support. And the people who do, you know, end up being able to thrive, they've, they usually are the people that are devoting time to, to managing their condition. So, and I, this is a little bit outrageous, but I'm actually giving away to anyone who signs up for Room to Thrive. It's $37 a month, or you can get a discount for paying six months up front. And for anyone who signs up before tomorrow, at the end of the day, tomorrow, Pacific time, you get my RA roadmap online course the self-paced course, which is $197 for free. I just, there's not, there's not like a catch. Like I'm literally, I'm doing that so that I'm, um, I'm going to put the, the little link here. It's like a way to kind of, um, what's the word? It's like a celebration of this room to thrive program starting, but this is, I'm not sure I'm ever going to like 
do this big of a giveaway again. So if you have, some of you might've been interested in the rheumatoid arthritis roadmap already. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you are interested, you can get it for $37. If you sign up for the road, the uh, room to thrive membership today. So it's free if you sign up. So um, then again, the, it, the options are the $37 for month to month, or you can get $50 off for doing a six month commitment for that's $172. So this is one time only for the next basically 48 hours. And that, that course walks you through is it's similar. Um, you can see the similar color coding covers similar things. It's, it's just um, framed a little differently. So physical, mental, social, and CEO. So those are very similar to the Thrive Toolbox. It's just a different way of looking at it. And it, it includes all these different um, pre-recorded modules where I'm taking you through how to um, manage each of these things. So, it, so please consider that um, because again, I, I, I think it's very helpful and the um, testimonials have been really amazing from the, from the roadmap. And <clears throat> the Room to Thrive is just kind of a different a way of packaging what I had already been doing. I had had an option for the roadmap previously where you have an eight week support group, but now I'm doing it as an ongoing because I just think that the ongoing is nice. You can get this group support going and it is going to be something where the doors open for registration and then close once a quarter. So that way for like three months, people in the current group get to know each other. And then as new people come in, we can kind of have this cohort and support feel. Cause I do know, um, I know one of these, the members that's here, um, had said, you know, she didn't feel, feel like if there was people kind of constantly coming and going, it might be a little bit harder to open up in that support part. So, um, you know, Stephanie had a great testimonial, you know, if it's, she said she felt that it helped, you know, that my <laughs> guidance helped her get insight into the new way of living and, you know, non-judgmental. I'm very open to whatever paths people are taking, you know, with their with their health. I'm just really focusing on the practical everyday tools and strategies. Um, and, you know, even people who've had it for a long time, Christina had had rheumatoid arthritis for 17 years when she took the rheumatoid arthritis roadmap course and the support program, you know, she said that it was very helpful even for a seasoned patient. So if there, um, wow, I cannot believe I ended this on time. I'm very excited. And yeah, yeah. And Camille is, Camille has helped give me some feedback on this program, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard for other people to understand. There really is a value in just being surrounded with like a community of people who just understand. So again, I put the link to sign up, but you can also oh, email me at info at my arthritis life.net if you have questions or I'm here. If you guys, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask anything, um, anything right now. Um, also, I guess I put my website. That's not helpful to have it without the hyperlink. Here we go. And I am also on all the different social medias. So I, un I unshared my screen so I could see you all better or see, you know, so you could see me better, but is there any question about how can you write with pain in your hands? Oh, this is a fun one. Okay. So when it comes to these life hacks, my, the first thing is, can you change the items or can you change how you use the items? So meaning if you are holding a pen like this, this little Sharpie, um, you can hold it with a little bit of a looser grip to help you, uh, not have, not squeezing as hard that releases some pressure, but I recommend changing the stuff by either getting like something called, um, a built up handle, which is like a, like a fat wide grip. Let me see. I don't, Oh, here's, here's an example of a, or getting a pencil like this that comes with that wider grip. A wider grip means that you're having less for less muscles required, or you can also change how you're holding it. Sometimes holding it with four fingers can help versus holding it with three or also using the Taylor Swift pencil grasp. This is literally considered an alternate grasp for people with arthritis pain. It helps especially with um, rheumatoid arthritis because your knuckles tend to push to the pinky normally. So it gives you a more comfortable position, but yeah, that's, this is, this is the alternate grasp that puts less stress on your knuckles. So this is a good one. And it happens to be the one that Taylor Swift uses, not, not due to arthritis to my knowledge, but Dr. Grip pens. Yeah. Really, really helps getting a wide grip. There's one called the jumbo grip, um, that can be really, really helpful. So, um, seconding Dr. Grip. Yeah. This is a Dr. Grip. Oh no, this is Unigel. Sorry. Unigel. But um, I know it's 10 o'clock, so if anyone, or 10 o'clock Pacific time, so if anyone needs to leave, um, 
don't don't feel badly. This is officially this presentation is concluded, but I'm I'll stick around if people have questions and I'm still recording it. So I'll record the answers. But thank you all so much for coming. I know this was a lot. I tried not to talk too fast, but thank you. And I will be sending out a copy of the recording to everyone who registered. Thanks, Emma. And Aaron, yay. Oh, I'm so glad to hear from you all. This is great. Thank you. You're welcome from across the pond. I really, okay. Oh, by the way, I have this idea when the pandemic is over, something called, I have, all I've done is I've named it. It's going to be called the Arthritis World Tour. <laughs> and what it is going to be so far is me going around the world, meeting all these amazing people I've met online and maybe videoing it or something and just talking to people and sharing their stories from around the globe. But, oh, thank you so much. Wow. I'm going to save all these comments and like tattoo them. Um, yes. Oh, so, oh yes. I'm so glad someone asked about the deal. So, um, the way that it works is so someone said, well, wait a minute. I don't see the roadmap on the sale on the page, the purchasing page. I'm going to put it in here again. So if you sign up for the room to thrive, even at 30, you can do $37 a month or 172 for six months, you will get, um, after your registration processes, I will add you to the rheumatoid arthritis roadmap course. They're both in the same website called Thinkific. So you won't see it immediately. I have to add you to it afterwards. There might be some smarter way to do it, but that's not, um, yes. Um, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Camille, you are my lifesaver. <laughs> that's what you meant. All panelists and attendees. Okay. There we go. Um, oh, I'm so glad. Yes. Yay. Was that Christine who said that? Um, that's so exciting. You signed up. Yes. Oh, this is, um, because I got, I got really excited and I, I made it, I made it, um, op open before I was planning on it. These are the, these are the, uh, letters of the names of people who've already signed up. This includes a few people that are like, uh, legacy, legacy people that had been, uh, done some of the previous programs. So they get, they are coming in as well, but yes. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. That was Christine. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize my links earlier weren't going to everyone. So here's my email. Um, yes. I'm so glad I posted on Instagram this morning and someone was like, I purchased it, but I don't see the roadmap or I don't see where I get the roadmap. I'm like, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, Carla signed up too. Yay. Oh, I'm so excited. And I wish I could, I don't think on a webinar I can, um, see everyone. I think it's just a meeting where you can see everyone. So I wish we could all talk now, but in, in less than a week, the first meeting is going to be April 1st. So, um, I'm really, really excited for it and yay. Okay. So, and what else was I, what else did I say earlier? I said, uh, oh, um, Dr. John Gottman, that's the marriage research and doc, Dr. Martin Seligman, is the U Pen Child Optimism and Explanatory Style. Yay. Bye, Camille. Bye, bye Carla. Or hi, Harla. Any anyone else have a question? Just kind of having like an awkward, awkward moment here. There's 24 of you still here. <laughs> are you just people who opened your window and are like, I won't sign off until she signs off. Bye. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, how did you decide, like, what medications to start? Like, oh. is that, like, something that you go over with one of the webinars or the, like, I just, I feel so overwhelmed and I haven't started anything yet. And I just, I guess, wanted to have more of, like, a, like a community to to figure that out with. Yeah, I do actually in the roadmap, um, pre-recorded course, I have a section in the beginning overviewing, like what are the different kinds? Sorry, that's my seven-year-old. What are the different kinds of medications and, um, and what, what do they do? But I, and we could definitely give like guidance in terms of or not guidance, we could give support in terms of this is what I tried. This is what I, what worked for me, but it is, there is definitely a part where I have to be careful about medical advice, right? right? Because that should come from your unique, like, and personalized medical team, right? But I could definitely help kind of say, what's a DMARD, a disease modifying anti-rheumatic agent versus a biologic versus something like prednisone that's like decreasing inflammation. Um, 
or ibuprofen, like a painkiller and an anti-inflammatory. So we could definitely help. And that would be under the tools for pain and fatigue. Like medication is one of like the underlying tools to, you know, manage and control your disease. So that will be something. And that actually is a good point that, so I'm going to have predetermined like overall topics, but the actual specific topic, let's say the, t- the, the topic is pain. Um, then the specific topic will be from what people and the membership say that they want to learn about. So, you know, if people are saying I'm really overwhelmed with the medications, I need like an overview of medications, then that, that yeah. can be what I do. That's what I like about a membership. It's kind of like, in, instead of like the course is great because I, and I recorded it and created it based on the FAQs, like frequently asked questions that I got, but it's not like it's already done. So yeah, then the membership allows us to be kind of flexible. Does that, does that help? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no problem. I know it's, I, in a way, like I got diagnosed in 2003 and I just did exactly what my doctor said. Like there wasn't any sort of like research or it's hard to ex- explain that how different the world kind of was back then, but it, it was just kind of like, um, the internet didn't really have that much stuff on it. What I remember, it was just kind of like, well, you're the expert. I'll just take methotrexate and Enbrel. And I, and I, they did great on them. So it worked for me, but I know now it's, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? It's better to have access to more information, but it can be a little bit scary and overwhelming. So yeah. Yeah. I, I feel, I feel you, <laughs> especially if the doctors aren't quite sure. I mean, there's protocols that rheumatologists have, you know, like first line, like usually methotrexate's the first, you know, line of defense for these conditions. And then, and then they add more if that doesn't work. But again, that's not to say that in your specific circumstance that they, they might make if someone's markers are really, really high and they're really, really suffering, they might be more aggressive. So yeah, it's a lot. It kind of medication management also falls under the umbrella of, of the E like executive functions and medical literacy, like understanding all this medical information being thrown your way. So it kind of goes on both the T and the E of, of thrive. I think it, it was just, it was helpful for me even to see you posted a video the other day of you're doing the injection yourself. And like, I don't know anyone that gives themselves injections. So like the mm-hmm. idea that I take that on myself is terrifying, but it's helpful to have a community that's like, this is how we do this and it's okay. Yeah. And so like, even just seeing that was really helpful. So oh, thank you. I'm so glad. No. And I feel like I actually feel like I've been insensitive because I didn't realize how many people had needle phobias and still I started doing it. Cause I'm like, I'm going to help people by showing my medication injections. Cause to me, I have phobias. Like I'm very claustrophobic and I, I, I can identify without terrifying, like a phobia feels, but I just happen to not have a needle phobia. So I didn't cross my mind. And so I guess I feel like I was, yeah, again, not really sensitive. And then when I posted that most people were like, thank you for posting this because it's helpful. And then a few people were like, trigger warning needed. Like, <laughs> don't just like post pictures of yourself with these giant syringes. And I was like, oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't think about it. But um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people in the, um, what's her name? House of Spoons. I always forget people's real names, but she started this campaign called Inject With Me, which is all about like, you know, um, normalizing injections and making it less scary and people doing like live injections. Um, another day with RA Allie, she, um, she also is, does some videos on, on her injections and she's pretty good. Kayla. Hi, I have an undiagnosed joint pain right now. Oh, that's really hard. Loops of various testing. If it ends up being osteoarthritis, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, the course is, is useful. The courses and the membership are going to be useful for people with chronic illnesses and, and, and chronic joint pain. The thing that won't be as applicable, there'll be extra stuff that won't be as applicable to you. If it ends up being osteoarthritis, it's kind of like, you'll be getting more than you need necessarily because things like fatigue aren't really associated with osteoarthritis and with a mechanical arthritis. Um, so the things like the life hacks and the ways to manage the pain are going to apply, but the fatigue and the systemic symptoms, it won't apply. So it's more a matter of, um, whether you want to, you know, more information than you need, if that's, if that's acceptable to to you. So, um, and some of the social part might not also apply, um, because a lot of times the social 
the social stresses from um, an inflammatory arthritis are more from people not understanding the systemic. People sometimes can understand pain more than they can understand fatigue or the mental side. Oh, thanks, Krista. I find all the information Cheryl talks about can apply to almost everyone, life skills as well as chronic illness. That's true. My most favorite thing to talk about is the mental side because it, it applies to all sorts of suffering or discomfort, not just arthritis, right? It just is life skills for a full life, a life that includes pain and sadness and happiness, you know, uh, everything because that's, that is life. Um, and so, um, yes. I, yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, is that Carla? Hi, it's Carla. Um, just wanted to say that that was actually um, a, a happy surprise to find when I was looking at your program because um, being recently diagnosed with RA, um, you were only given the medical piece, the medications, and here's some info about diet, and then that's it. But um, I didn't realize how much mental health uh, takes, you know, plays a role here, and having to even find the right therapist is is helpful. And um, I actually started that, and I shared ACT with my therapist. And he was happy to incorporate it in our uh, treatment. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And, um, but it is, it's crazy how um, that's not automatically almost given to you or recommended to you. Uh, even as you're, I guess I tell my rheumatologist, I'm overwhelmed. Like, I don't know what to do. And, and there's a pill for that. There's a pill for that, but that's yeah. really not what I'm looking for, you know? So thank you for, for oh. doing that. I'm so glad. No, and I, I totally agree. It's really interesting now. Um, there are, there's a whole role if you get diagnosed for diabetes of a person called like a diabetes educator, and they're not really even for the mental health. They're, they're more for just the logistics, but at least it's something, you know, they teach people with diabetes, like the basics of how to manage their condition and how to do the insulin injections, all that. And I'm like, what? You know, and I know people who can verify this, who've said that they have both diabetes and like a, you know, inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. And they're like, my diabetes is so much easier to manage than, you know, not, and not to play the blame game, but, or not, or that, you know, who's suffering more, but yeah, like, I feel like people with get, who got newly diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis need just so much more comprehensive support than they're currently getting. And some places have started doing it, like giving people like an appointment with a social worker who can also do counseling but it's not the standard practice and it's, it's really sad. And I'm, I'm glad that you are, you know, oh, that you've been at least made aware, I guess, through my page about yes. <laughs> the importance of, yeah, I'm glad that you found me. No, um, I, I yeah. am glad too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Aaron's saying my disease came on strong and went undiagnosed for a while. Uh, okay. This is to all attendees. So I can read it. Um, went on leave for my physical job, ended up being off for too long and lost the job. Shoot couldn't go back. And now having to look at going back to school, it's very overwhelming. Yeah. Anyone who talks specifically about school or new jobs for people with chronic illness, you don't know where to start. You're in your late thirties. Um, I, I mean, I, okay. I'm going to sound really biased here, but I honestly think so an occupational therapist, we do more than just jobs. Like sometimes people get confused. I think occupational therapist helps with their jobs, but we, we can, we help people with their life skills. And one of the life skills is having a job and determining physically what might and, and emotionally what might be a good fit for you job wise. I actually think it, you could ask your doctor for a referral to an occupational therapist and they could, you know, do an assessment, walk through you, what your current abilities are, what are your interests and what might work for you. Honestly, that could be what's really helpful. <laughs> and that is actually totally in our wheelhouse and our scope of practice. I don't know what, let me know what state you're in or country, because I might, I might know someone. I mean, I technically have my business set up so I, where I can do one-on-one -on -one therapy in Washington state. Um, but I just haven't, pr I was going to start setting that up back in 2020. And then I was like, too much, too much going on. <laughs> um, how do you recommend to manage fatigue? Yes. So I will be honest that fatigue, there are less, it's okay if Teddy's here, there's less, there's less tools for fatigue than pain. That's just, unfortunately, the reality. Um, I think because the whole scientific community around rheumatoid arthritis has really focused on pain and joint deformity and joint joint symptoms and not focus on fatigue. And I, and that's starting to change, but like, it wasn't even until like 
in the last decade that they even looked at, and it was from patient um, patient feedback, the FDA started looking at whether these medications for rheumatoid arthritis are should be FDA approved for fatigue and pain or just pain. And it's like pain or fatigue affects your quality of life so much. So somewhat, there are tools, they're just not as robust, I would say, as the tools for pain. Um, but the but the first one is prevention, like preventing fatigue by doing your basic self care, like sleep, <laughs> sleep hygiene. Um, and fatigue is different than sleepiness, but if you're already sleepy, you can make fatigue worse. So, and then planning your day to where you can um, conserve energy. So energy conservation and um, activity pacing are really good. So stopping and taking a break, let's say you go to the grocery store and you're unloading groceries into your house, you know, can you chunk that task out to where you take a, a bag in and then rest for a few minutes, take another one in. So I don't know if you've ever seen the spoon theory, but the spoon theory is like a way to like have a, um, a metaphor for that energy units are your physical energy units are like spoons. And so you think about how can you make your spoons last a whole day? Um, and so those are really prevention tools. They can help a lot. And then the other one is talking, um, some doctors will prescribe stimulant medication for severe fatigue. So the same medications that's used for ADHD, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but I'm saying it's something you can ask your doctor about because it, it can help. So another thing that's very counterintuitive, but if you have a rheumatic disease and you don't have ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, also known as ME, like myalgic encephalomyopathy, I think is what how you say it, um, then exercise is evidence-based for fatigue. And I know it sounds unintuitive because you'd think, wait a minute, you have to spend energy to make energy, but it's because it kind of gets it makes your circulation go and your lymph move and your lymph is part of your immune system and and it um you know exercise and musculature supports your joints. So exercise actually is evidence-based for fatigue. So, um, yeah. Um, let's see. I'm in Canada, Aaron. I want to go into mental health and open. Yeah. To what that looks like. You don't know who to talk to when it comes to adaptations for schooling. Oh yeah. So yeah. And then you can also talk to, um, the disability support services. And if you're looking into a specific program, you can talk to disability support services, at least in the US, that's what it's called. And they help people get accommodations for school and for work. Yeah. So a career coach, yeah, a career coach would be another one. So an occupational therapist, they, they are, there are occupational therapists that can help you in, in Canada, but yeah, a career coach would be a, a good one too. They just might not understand your disease on as it's kind of granular of a level. And any recommendations on the methotrexate hangover? Yes. <laughs> um, the methotrexate hangover is hard. You can always talk to your doctor about upping like your folic acid. Hopefully you're taking folic acid because that's supposed to help with it. Um, and there are supplements and I'm not a big um, like, you know, supplements are an unregulated industry, so they can be very dangerous, but there are some um, supplements that people find they can find helpful for, I always forget which ones are the ones from at the truck say, I think it's like vitamin B or D. So, um, I, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah. And then planning your day around it, you know, knowing whether, okay, if you're, if your methotrexate hangover happens 12 hours after versus 24 hours after like, or versus immediately, you know, taking it at the time of day, like taking it to where you can time the hangover with your sleep, your natural sleep patterns and taking it like, unfortunately, a lot of people end up taking it on the weekend because then that way it doesn't affect their work life as much, but then it's hard, right? Cause then it affects your family life, but that could be something that, that you try as well. Oh, and certain kinds of medication, if okay by doctor can help with the hangover. Yeah. Maybe even, I know stimulant medication, like the ADHD medication is, it has a very short half-life. So maybe that could be something you take just on your methotrexate. Oh, Krista. I was hoping Krista was still here. Sorry. I could, I didn't, I didn't scroll down to see folic acid, B complex. Okay. So B was right. And ginger for nausea. Yeah. So B, vitamin B can help with the energy. Yeah. Um, you know, a functional medicine practitioner can be a really good um, person on your team or an integrative, integrative medicine doctor. So these are, those are, doc, um, if you do functional medicine can be a doctor or another professional or an in, um, integrative or 
lifestyle medicine doctor can help you with some of these things. Cause sometimes rheumatologists don't, um, ha- they are just, they have so many different conditions they have to study. They don't always know all the alternative things that can help. So, um, there, I just did a podcast with Dr. Um, Micah, you from my autoimmune MD, and he has a lot, he is like, and he has a rheumatic disease and he's really up to speed on all of the different things you could be doing, um, that are like not medication. Yay. Thank you all so much. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to wrap up and help my little guy with school. Um, my, my family's been helping me, but um, thank you all so much. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Margaret's here. So I just saw, I just like remembered to scroll to see everyone. Um, so thank you all. And I look forward to seeing some of you in the membership. Oh, let me put the link here one more time. And um, I thank you for your time and your, your great questions. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Bye.